I'd like to welcome you to another episode of The Charm of It, a podcast for knitters who enjoy the nitty-gritty details of our craft. I'm Eva. As returning viewers will know, it's good to see you again. And this is Thistle, one of my co-hosts. Sorry. Welcome to any new viewers who are giving me a try for the first time. I tend to focus mainly on my knitting projects, so if you like that kind of thing, maybe I'm for you. I'm actually trying out a new format, so I've been recording hypothetically every other week. In reality, usually every three to four weeks, and those episodes get very long. And so what I'm thinking about doing, and they also take a while to edit, they take a while to put all the show notes together and everything, and that's worth it to me, but I thought it might be interesting to try out doing an episode weekly but not the same type of episode every time. So half of the weeks I'll be doing episodes like you're used to seeing that include a bunch of different segments and have extensive show notes and all of that. And then on the other weeks, I'm just going to be doing project updates. And I thought that that way it won't take quite so much time to talk about my projects during the bigger episodes, and therefore they won't be quite so long. And... Um, it will get me on a schedule because for some reason recording once a week is easier for me to, sorry, my cat is hopping up to say hello. Anyway, it's easier for me to stick to just one day rather than every two weeks. I tend to just put it off. So for this to be doable for me, I need to not have to do show notes for the briefer podcast, uh, blah, blah, project <laughs> update po videos. The thing is that I always include a lot of the information on, about my projects in my project notes on Ravelry, so you can always go there to find any information, and if there's something that you need to know that's not there, you can get in touch with me, either leave a comment on that project on Ravelry or message me on Ravelry, and I'll be able to answer it that way, but it would just not be sustainable for me to do show notes with the photos and everything like that every week. So we're going to try this out and see how it goes because I really love having this podcast and I love being able to talk to you. And sometimes when it takes a while to record a bigger episode, I forget some of the details about projects. So I have high hopes. We will see. Um, let's see. I'm drinking iced tea today and not wearing any hand knits because summer came back. It's better for me not to talk about it because then you'll see my ranty side. <laughs> the good news is there's... Lots of big, heavy thunder clouds outside my window right now, which makes for good lighting. <laughs> so let's go ahead and get started. Moth might hop over here. She's on the little table I have next to my chair right now. Okay, so some of these projects you've seen and some you have not. I'll start with the sweater I'm knitting for my sister. Maybe. It's attached to a ball of yarn that's buried in here. Okay, so this is the Busy Sisterhood cardigan, and it's a mashup of the Honey Bee cardigan by Laura Chow and the Little Waves cardigan by Gudrun Johnston, which are both paid for patterns. I'll be talking, once I finish this, about what I think of those patterns, because I've used them both twice now. But I already showed you my last episode that I finished the body, but I forgot to mention two things. Actually, three things. Okay, so... First of all, let me find, I marked it. Okay, so this yarn is a silk cotton blend. It is Cosette by Knit One Crochet Two. And my usual method when I'm joining yarn for a cardigan, usually I'm using wool, so I spit splice or felt splice. It's where you get it wet, I use water, and rub it together in your hands and then it magically felts. Obviously that's not gonna work with a plant-based yarn. So for my mom's cardigan, I just went ahead and joined in the skeins as I went, and since they were 50 gram balls and it was air and weight yarn, that left quite a few ends to weave in. And with my mom's cardigan, it was mainly stockinette, so that was fine. But with my sister's, this is, you know, very lacy and open, and there's not a super clear seam. I could hide it in the button band, but instead I decided to try out a Russian join, which is a way of joining the yarn, basically. Um, uh, I'll include a link in the project notes since I won't be doing show notes this week. But it's it's kind of 
it's similar to spit splicing in that you end up with no ends to leave in. I've removed the safety pin so that you can see better. It's right there that the Russian join is. And it's poofing out a little right now just because I pulled the safety pin out. But if I were to just pull the fabric so that the yarn goes back in, as you can see, it doesn't really show at all. And here's the back. I'm super pleased with how that worked because it spares me having to weave it ends later. It probably takes the same amount of time as to do a Russian join as it would to weave in the two ends later, but it's just nice to be able to do it as you go in a way that allows you to frog if you need to. That's why I don't do regular weaving in the yarn as I go because I feel like I'm tempting fate and as soon as I weave in those ends I'm going to have to rip back. I do rip a lot in my knitting, so. So that was one thing I wanted to talk about. I'll definitely be using the Russian join in the future. The other thing was I added a little bit of waist shaping to the sweater. Um, and I did it the same way that I did the waist shaping for my honeybee cardigan, where I just decreased the needle size. And you can see the honeybees getting smaller. The reason why I chose to do that, first of all, is because this is an all over lace pattern. But I certainly could have just reduced all of these faggoting stitches. That's what it's called, this type of lace work. And then increase them again. But I just thought that since I'm doing pretty gentle waist shaping, changing the needle size would work well enough. And I prefer that to the kind of waist shaping that's written into the Little Waves cardigan, which has garter stitch panels up the sides, and you do your waist shaping there, which is fine. Except that, for me at least, a lot of the difference between my waist and hips is in my lower back. I have a quite curved lower back. So even though my waist does go in on the sides, it goes in even more on the back. And so if I don't decrease stitches on that, I end up getting pooling in my lower back. And I know that my mother is the same way. I'm assuming my sister is too. I think to a certain extent, most adult women are. So if I'm not going to be doing princess seam style decreases, I prefer to just change needle sizes because that decreases it evenly all around. And then the last thing that I wanted to talk about was my sister wanted a v-neck. When I did this cardigan for myself, I made it with a round neck and so binding off in pattern wasn't an issue because I could just bind straight across. And then when I added the neck band, that made the neckline curved. But binding off becomes an issue when you're doing v-necks because you do a much more gradual decreasing. So it wasn't a problem to bind off in pattern for this stitch, but in order to get the honeybees to look right, I think, yeah, I took three tries. The first time after this one, I tried just doing plain stockinette and decreasing there, but because the rest of the cardigan is completely open, the stockinette just stood out like a sore thumb. So I ripped that back. And then I tried, instead of doing stockinette, doing this lace panel here, but that also just looked really awkward. So when I was trying both of these, I was doing a decrease every other row, which I think is pretty standard v-neck shaping. And what I decided to do instead when I realized I was going to have to maintain that bee stitch was do a decrease every row because the bees are 12 stitches across and they're six rows tall. So if I decrease every, uh, if I do one decrease every row, that means that a full B repeat will decrease half of the Bs. And so you end up, I just think it's easier to maintain the pattern that way and have it not look so awkward. So what I did was I basically did a half B stitch for this and these I did leave in plain stockinette, but since I was decreasing them so quickly, it doesn't stand out. I just wanted to talk about that because like with my hat, the decreasing in pattern worked out for the first time the first time I tried it, but that doesn't, that's not always the case. I'm not some kind of, you know, decreasing in pattern magician or something. So I just wanted to talk about what eventually worked for me and how sometimes my first ideas are not the best ideas. Okay, so I'm almost done with the first sleeve of my sister's sweater. Although you saw the podcast, although I only uploaded it last week, it's actually been two weeks in my time which is everyone else's time. Um, I'm just letting you know so that you're not wondering how I did all this knitting in a week. But here's the sleeve so far. It looks kind of raggedy. Um, 
I think it'll smooth out with blocking. But this yarn is kind of the rustic plant fiber. You can come up this one. Hey, babe. So as you can see, I'm mainly doing plain stockinette. That was my sister's request so that she could easily layer. But she wanted one honeybee on the inside of each wrist. So there is the first little honeybee, which I think is a fun touch. She wanted nice, long, slouchy sleeves with a fold-up cuff. So I'm pretty much doing the sleeves from the Little Waves cardigan. I apologize for how long my camera is taking to switch between focus, but at least it's switching before it was frozen and I'd have to reset. Anyway, because I'm doing plain stockinette, I actually decreased a needle size for this because I didn't want as open a fabric as I have on the body because I really hate it when I try to put a sweater on over a sleeved blouse and the sleeve shows through. So I'm knitting the body on fours and I'm knitting the sleeve on a three. I'm a loose... Well, I'm not super loose when I'm knitting English style, which is how I'm knitting this, but um, I'm never a tight knitter. And I went down to twos for the cuff just because it tends to make the ribbing neater if you do one or two stitches or one or two needle sizes lower. And I've mainly been knitting this as my reading knitting um, because it's very easy for me to knit stockinette in the round if I'm reading an ebook. I've got my nook prepped up on one side and I just go around and around. I did do quite a few increases, as you can see. My sister does not want the sleeves tight around her biceps at all, so she sent me her bicep measurement, and I added three inches to it. And so I've been increasing accordingly. I just kind of stopped at some point on the sleeve and measured it to see what my gauge was doing since I hadn't done a gauge swatch. I know that with cotton yarns, they're going to behave a little differently than wool, but since my sister wants slouchy sleeves. I don't think that'll be a huge problem since she can turn up the cuff as much as she wants. And since I'm not knitting a pair of socks right now, I'm keeping it in my DPN holder. But the other DPN fell out. Oh, well, I'll find it later. This is probably laying on it. Oh, there it is. She was laying on it. I wish you could see her. She's resting her little head on my knee. So, yeah, almost done with that. I think I have about an inch left to go. I'm just going to make them as long as my Tide Pool cardigan sleeves are because my sister tried that sweater on when she came to visit and she liked the length, although she wanted them wider. And then I will cast on for the second one. So I didn't knit on this for a while because I got really distracted by the color work vest I'm going to talk about. But once I started knitting on it, since it's plain stockinette and I can knit while I'm reading and stuff, it goes nice and quickly. So I'm really hoping to get that sweater done soon. I mean, we've had another heat wave, so I don't mind keep continuing to knit with the plant fiber. But I currently have three garments on the needles, and that's a lot for me. Plus, I need to start my Christmas knitting, and the first thing I want to start is another plant fiber. And earlier, when I was knitting my elephant chair slipcover and my sister's sweater, that was two plant fiber projects. And I said at the beginning of the summer that I prefer to only do one for my hands, but I tried to like break that rule and my hands were not happy. So I'm back to only doing one at a time, which can be a little frustrating, but I'm really excited with how my sister's sweater is turning out and I think that she'll really enjoy it. So I'm not frustrated with the sweater. It's just, um, I don't have the ideal rotation of projects right now in my basket and I'm not sure how to fix that without finishing something. <laughs> Okay, so since I talked about the color work best, I guess I will show you that next. So this is my herbarium best, and I know I've got a swatch in here somewhere. And it's done with Alice Starmore Hebridean two-ply yarn, which is made in England to her specifications, and she dyes the wool and then spins the yarn, which makes for a lot of really beautiful, really complex colors. It's the yarn that I've been using to make bookmarks, this little nails, I'm wearing shorts today, um, all summer long, and so you've seen it. And when I made the bookmark for my sister, I really loved how those particular colors look together. So I decided that I wanted to do a larger scale project for that, but I didn't really want to do another hat. I considered leg warmers. But Fruity Knitting is doing a Fair Isle garment knit along, and I realized that a small cropped vest would use less yarn than leg warmers. And since 
most of the colors I only have one ball of, that was definitely a consideration. I have to start a new segment and then I will tell you about it. I started planning for this project I think two or three weeks ago, but I would not let myself cast on until I finished my aunt's socks. So once I finished them, and she received them and loved them by the way, so woohoo success, I started swatching. And originally I had in my head that I was going to do, because I want, you know, the 1940s style cropped vests or waistcoats if you're British or part of the former British Empire. Um, I'm not making like underwear. Uh, anyway, you see them a lot in the 40s on men with the collared shirts and they usually have kind of striped bands of larger designs and then smaller designs and I really like that. So originally that's what I thought I was going to do. So I started swatching and these are my colors. I had a couple other colors that I was swatching with so these are the final ones. Oh, it's hard to see them through the bag. Hang on. Okay. Ooh. <laughs> trying to gather them all up. You can see some of them and there's the rest. Okay, so I started swatching and I was just having a heck of a time. If you follow me on Instagram, I was trying really hard to post quite a few of the ones that didn't work out. And if you don't follow me on Instagram, you can see all the photos I remember to take with my iPhone before ripping out swatches on the project page. So you can kind of watch it evolve. And I was going to alternate 13 band border repeats with like five band period repeats. But every time I was trying to like transition between the background colors or work out the shading, I was just getting really frustrated because I love all these colors and I love them together, but for Fair Isle to work, you have to have a certain amount of value contrast. And a lot of these colors, that means you can't you can't you can't combine them like in one row because there's not enough value contrast between them and so I was getting incredibly frustrated because almost everything I thought would work out in my head did not work out quite so well in the in practice you saw a couple of those swatches on my last episode on the plus side I got a whole lot of practice in Fair Isle knitting flat it's no longer like difficult for me to purl stranded because I did so much of it. I was knitting flat just so that I didn't have to put a bunch of stitches to be able to knit in a circle. Anyway, and so then it occurred to me that the whole inspiration for this piece was the bookmark that I did for my sister, which had, for the foreground, it shaded from green to pink to this kind of pinky beige. This is the foreground shading for the bookmark. And the background shading went from cool to warm purple. And I realized that a lot of the other colors that I was trying to work with, oh, sorry, this isn't purple, that's silky. Okay, cool to warm purple, does that make more sense? Don't worry, I have another skein of this. Um, that a lot of the colors that I was looking at, they basically divided quite neatly into two camps. The purpley background, and I ended up adding one in between them. And then a, green, <clears throat> a greeny background with the one in between. And both of the ones in between are more heathered. And then the other color that I added to the foreground is a pale yellow, just so that I could have a nice glowing center. Originally, I had a brighter pink and a deeper dark yellow that I was going to use as pops. I wish that I hadn't ripped out all my swatches now so that I could show you. But basically, what, wait, no, I think this swatch I still have, I can show you. Okay, so what happened when I did that you can actually see it before it even decides to focus, is that both the brighter pink, which is clover, and the deeper yellow, which is uh, golden clover, I didn't realize they rhymed until just now, they're both, they overwhelm the foreground 
Um, and they draw all the attention to that. And I didn't like that at all. And so I did switch those out. But okay, so we're back to the original idea where I decided to always keep the same colors as the foreground and shade the background. And rather than to do stripes of banded color, like switching in between peris, to do one all over pattern. I guess the camera's decided I should talk to you in blurry mode. Let's see if, if I take a drink of iced tea, it might notice me back here. Yep. <laughs> Apparently my camera is a predator. <laughs> it's, it focuses on motion. <laughs> anyway. Um, what was I saying? Okay, so I decided to do one all over pattern, keep the foreground the same, and shade between the backgrounds. So I pulled out the Alice Starmore Charts for Color Knitters book, which I got at the beginning of summer. And I'll, I'll review that another time because it's very different from her Fair Isle book. I wonder if you guys can hear the thunder. And I found a couple patterns that didn't work. And then I found this pattern. And I really loved it. But the first swatch I did, which I have since ripped out because I need that yarn back because I did a big swatch. Um, the way the pattern is written, the what looks dark in these photos is shown as the little dots which is usually what you do with your foreground color and what looks light in these photos so you know the shapes the flower and i guess the bigger flower norwegian star really are were shown as the background so when i knit it the first time that's what i did so the the flowers and the norwegian stars were all in the darker colors and that looked really pretty in its own right but it's not what I was going for because what I wanted was to really focus on that watercolor effect of the green shading into the pink instead of vice versa. I will say that both the clover and the golden plover worked beautifully when it was switched the other way. You can see it on my project page because instead of there being a bunch of stitches in that color, there was just like three. And so it glowed really nicely. And if that had been the effect I wanted, I would have stopped there. But since I wanted the focus to be on the lighter colors and I wanted it to have kind of a not dusty because that doesn't sound good but you know like a patina to it I wanted it to feel muted so I, I did another swatch switching them and then I did quite a bit of duplicate stitching on this to decide because when the swatch with the reverse colors it glowed in the center and that's what I really love about Fair Island Knitting and this swatch does not glow in the center um, in the same way. And so I did quite a bit of duplicate stitching to decide what I wanted to do for the main body. And finally I got it sorted in a way that I liked. And so I have this on a 16 inch circular, which makes it harder because it's like 28 inches to show you. But I love how this is turning out. I've done two repeats so you can see both backgrounds. It's curling right now. I did a provisional cast on because I haven't decided what color I'm doing the ribbing yet in since I'm playing yarn chicken. I'm guessing it'll probably be, I've got two skeins of selkie, so it'll probably be selkie as the ribbing. Originally I thought I was going to do a corrugated rib and I still want to do that around the neckline and maybe the armholes if I have enough yarn, but I don't want to do it at the waist because I really want stretchiness of actual ribbing since I want to do a nice fitted waist. Um, I'm sure that surprises you. <laughs> yeah, so here's how it's turning out, and I'm really happy because it glows in the center. Uh oh, I'm losing stitches, that's okay. It glows in the center, and I think that it transitions really well. And here's how it looks from further away, which is what most people will see, and I think it flatters me. So I'm super happy about this. The reason why it's on a 16 inch cable is because I was using my size zero uh, heavy metal needles, which are my interchangeable set, which have the longer cable for a different project, and gauge is important in that project. So I just used the only other size zero needle I have, which are the Addy, Addy Turbo Circulars. And because I don't really tighten up when I'm knitting Fair Isle, so I'm getting just under seven stitches to the inch, about 6.8 stitches to the inch. 
on size zeros with this yarn. And I think it makes a nice firm fabric, which is good when you're going to be layering a vest over things, but it's not like too firm. And there are my floats so far in case you're an inside out kind of person. And I love how sticky this yarn is. Look, there's all these all these uh, stitches off the needle and none of them are going anywhere because of how sticky the yarn is. The rain has arrived. I will try to project my voice more loudly. So that's that project and I'm so happy with it. And honestly, before I decided to rethink my approach, I was beginning to think that it, I just wasn't up to the challenge and that I should just scrap the whole thing. So it's always darkest before dawn and yeah, I learned that I really, really need to respect value because whenever I try to pretend it doesn't matter, I'm never happy with the results. And since it's going to be cropped, I really don't expect it to take me that long. I really hope I don't run out of yarn, but I've got a few contingency plans in my mind for that, and we will see. The next project I'll mention is the one that is using my size zeros and this is my lace weight jumper that I'm knitting the body at like 11 stitches to the inch and therefore I didn't want to like gauge is important with something like that and I'm not going to rip back on this and so I wanted to use the same needles I had swatched with. I'm knitting this flat. I'm using a custom fit pattern for the first time and this is the back piece. I've already knit one of the sleeves. This is one of those projects that's going to take forever so you're going to be seeing it a lot. It's knit out of Knit Pick Shadow, which is their 100% merino lace. It's regular merino, not super wash, and it's in the opal heather color, which I just love. More accurate back here. And I have finished my five inches of ribbing. This is another vintage inspired um, sweater. This one is going to be long sleeve, a jumper. And then I'm hoping to do a little tie at the neck. Originally I was thinking a long tie for a bow, but now I'm just thinking one of those little short, cute ties you know what I'm talking about. Almost more like a bow tie. Although I will not tie it as a bow tie, just like a floppy knot. Not that long. Anyway, so I did the ribbing on size triple zeros, and it's a baby cable rib. I really love that texture. It's totally worth the hours and hours and hours and hours that it took, because this is 184 stitches across and it's funny because my vest is 192 stitches around so that tells you how fine this gauge is anyway so i've just begun the pattern work on the body and it's an all over texture pattern if you watch my other episodes you've already seen it on the sleeve and i'll just be knitting straight until the armholes because this deep ribbed panel is where I'm putting all of my waist shaping. I'm doing the same thing on my color work vest, by the way. Originally, I thought, I think we have time to talk about it. Originally, I thought I was going to be adding more stitches as I got up to the vest. And so what I did is rather than just do it in a circle, because it's quite a big repeat, it's a 26 stitch repeat if you want to be able to do both. So instead what I did, and you want to have that, you want it centered under your face so that it looks best. So in order to center it, you do 26 times whatever, and then you add 17 in order to have that last repeat. And I did that on both sides. And then I have one stitch that's always in the background as the seam, which is easier to find when I haven't lost half my stitches. Hang on, I'll do it on this side. Okay. So as you can see, right at the side seams, rather than alternating, the pattern repeats itself. And that does mean, maybe you can see it, that does mean that I have to carry the foreground stitches over quite a few here, but as long as I catch them at least two stitches apart on each row, it doesn't show. So you can kind of see there where I did it right above each other. So on this one, I made sure to be much more careful or up here, and you can't really see it at all. Anyway, so that centers the motifs on both the front and the back. And originally, I thought that this one side seam stitch was going to be expanding into maybe between 5 to 10 stitches, depending on my gauge. 
in order to have um, the bust I was planning to do with two inches of negative ease, and I have a 33 inch bust, so I was planning to do 31 inches there. I wasn't sure what my gauge would be in the round. I found that trying to swatch in the round, look, now I've got like so many stitches off and still nothing running. I love this yarn. Anyway, <laughs> trying to swatch in the round for me on anything other than my project always gets me a different gauge, and I think it's because I just knit differently when I have enough stitches to go around a regular circular needle than when I'm doing smaller circumference knitting. So that's why I just, I measured the gauge on those flat swatches that I had knit and used that as kind of an estimate. And I started with the size zero needles. And what I did was after this first repeat was done, I popped it on waste yarn and measured it to see whether I wanted to go up to size ones or not. And this is about between 27 and 28 inches in diameter right now. I think it's 28. And I tried it on. Um, I was a little concerned that my shoulders would be too wide because stranded knitting is not as stretchy. <laughs> and my shoulders are like 38 inches around. So luckily that's not an issue, I think, because you put your arms up when you're trying on clothes. Anyway, <laughs> that's the other reason why I don't want to do corrugated rib at the waist, though, because if I want a fitted waist, I need to knit it about 22 inches so that there's at least two inches of negative ease. Um, my waist varies between 24 and 26 inches, depending on what the meds are doing to me and what I've eaten and all that kind of stuff. So, so that's why I prefer regular ribbing as well. But back to this. So when I tried it on, I noticed that I actually liked how the 28 inches looked around my bust. That's five inches of negative ease, which I know sounds ridiculous, but it actually looks perfectly normal. And I have never had this kind of pullover vest before, but I already know that the way that I'm going to style it is going to be with wide-legged trousers and full skirts. And I am not going to be happy unless it's got a lot of fitted shape to balance out the wideness that's going to be on the bottom of me. And so I already knew that I would be doing quite a bit of negative ease at the bust. And so I was a little surprised that 28 inches around is big enough, even in stranded knitting, but it really is. And so I'm not going to add any shaping for the bust. I'm not going to go up a needle size. I'm not going to add stitches. I'm just going to leave it like it is. Um, yeah, so I realized that I'd forgotten to talk about that and how you center a pattern and stuff. If you don't know, Alice Starmore's book, The Art of Fair Isle Knitting, talks you through how to center patterns, um, in case it's not intuitive. Okay, we are almost done with projects. I've got five going right now. So, two more. This is my Distant Shores scarf. I realized after I recorded my last episode that I was reading a Patricia McKillop short story collection called Dreams of Distant Shores. I hadn't actually processed the title consciously. I just kept thinking of it as the new Patricia McKillop collection because I love her. But yeah, that's totally what the title was. So I'm sure that that helped inspire me to name this, even though I did not realize it. Okay, so this is going to be a scarf and it's knit using the waves of grain pattern which is free it was a knitty pattern and it's got a little bit of beading down at the bottom and then I love these beads once you finish the kind of decorative section at the bottom you're doing the same two rows over and over for the body and once you use up half your yarn, you start at the other end so that they match, and then you do the same thing and you graft it in the middle. There you go, now you can kind of see the things, although that's lighter than it is in reality. Um, so this is about 70 stitches across, which is quite similar to what I do for socks. Well, socks are usually 60 to 64. I'll take another drink.
I have to start in the same. Okay, my socks are usually, if I'm doing them for me, between 56 and 64 stitches. But that's close enough that I keep telling myself that this is like a sock project. And the return rows are just plain curling. I'm showing you the wrong side. And then this row is a very simple lace pattern that I memorized very quickly. So it's a simple project, and I keep telling myself that that'll make it fun. But I'm already ready for it to be over with, and I've only used a quarter of my yarn. I really want to be a scarf knitter. Rain started coming in my window, so I had to back up the chair and the tripod. I don't want my camera to drum. I really want to be a scarf knitter because I love wearing scarves. Not shawls, but scarves. And like the wide scarves, too. So this is kind of an experiment for me. And we'll see. Hopefully I'll be won over by it eventually. But yeah, so I'm halfway through. I've got two 50 gram skeins, and this currently makes 25 skeins. Um, I'm still trying to find my sweet spot on scarf knitting. The yarn is Mountain Meadows, their new heavy lace fingering called Hannah, which is 100% Targi, so that's a new breed for me. It's so bouncy, you guys. I don't know if you can see that, but so bouncy. And the the colorway is navy. They hand dye their yarns. And they're um, a very ethical company based in Wyoming that does a lot. They work with the ranchers. They make sure that their processes are environmentally friendly. You, whenever you buy yarn from them, you can kind of trace it back to the specific ranch it came from, which I think is really cool. I did not buy this yarn. They sent it to me in exchange for um, featuring them on the podcast. Which I was glad to do since I like their privilege or their privileges. And there's currently a giveaway and a coupon code for them. If you're interested, all the details are in my Ravelry group. Anyway, yes, yeah, so I'm really happy with the yarn. I'm a little bored by the project, but hopefully once I have finished my sister's sleeves, this will be my only simple project, and so then I'll probably be grateful to it. Let's hope. But yeah, I really like how it's turning out. I want to wear the finished thing. I'm just not sure I want to knit it. And finally, I cast on last night for a hat. And that's because I talked about in my last episode, I switch between heavier yarn and lighter yarn so that my hands don't hurt as much. And you might have noticed that all these projects are with fingering or lace weight yarn. And so even though I prefer to only have four projects going at once, I really needed to add something in heavier yarn. So this is the beginnings of a hat. I've got two more rounds of ribbing left, and then I start the pattern. And this yarn is Mono Silk Uruguay um, Silk DK, I think, Merino Silk DK. It's 50-50 Merino Silk. And it's DK weight, and it's in the coal colorway. I got this during a, a sale at my local yarn, yarn shop down in Texas when I was visiting my family over Christmas. And I've been happily using this yarn for all kinds of things. I got it in three colors. And this is going to be the Press Leaves hat by Alana Dacos, which is out of Botanical Knits 1. It's a very beautiful kind of um, twisted stitch leaf pattern that I really love. I was inspired to knit it in gray by Catherine. She's from Norway, so it might not be pronounced Catherine there. It probably isn't. But she did a beautiful one in gray. Before that, I was thinking to do it in more of a green color, but I'm really excited. And it makes me think of the uh, 12 Dancing Princesses, which, if you don't know that fairy tale, these 12 sisters are going into an underground fairyland every night and they're dancing their slippers to shreds and they're the king their father they have no mother is at his wits end trying to figure out where his daughters are going to and so he is told any man who can figure it out that he can have the hand of one of his daughters and he will be the king you know in the future and so a soldier comes and so oh but if the man can't figure it out in three nights he gets killed so a pretty big risk. And so far the sisters have managed to trick all of the men who have tried with sleeping potions, so they've all died. And a soldier comes to court, and because he's helped this little old lady along the way, who turns out to be a witch, 
she has given him some advice, and he thwarts the sleeping potions, and he follows the sisters into fairyland for three nights to figure out what's going on. And as they're going to the ball, they pass through three forests, one of which has trees made of gemstones, one of which has trees made of gold, and one of which has trees made of silver. And he breaks off branches with trees. So doing leaves in this very pretty silvery gray reminds me of that fairy tale. I haven't named this project yet since I started it last night, but I'm pretty sure the name is going to refer to that. And now it is a deluge instead of rain. I have finished talking about my project, so I'm going to let you guys go. I will see you next week with a bigger episode. Please let me know if this new idea for a format works for you. I'm hoping it works for me.